This morning, we just thought it would add a lot of value if we had an opportunity to hear from our guest speaker, Kevin Gear, And then also, today we're privileged to have our network leader, Don Ross, with us. Um, and I know for myself, I have lots of questions, and I like to lean into the wisdom of the wise. Um, and so this morning, we have an opportunity to do that. Our a team has put together some questions that we're going to kind of just have a discussion with them while we drink our coffee casually. You can even kind of close your eyes to like half open and just kind of listen to them if you want to lean back. This is like your time you're allowed to sleep in church. Don't do that. Um, <laughs> um, but if we also have some questions you can answer, uh, text in up on the screen. Um, and we'll put that number up there right there. Oh, there it is, 937. So if you have some questions that you'd like to send in, we won't get to them all, but we'll try to get to a few of them. Uh, but I would like to welcome this morning uh, Don Ross, Kevin Gear, Bethy, why don't you come on up here? We're glad that you guys are here, and we just want to take a kind of a kickback moment, opportunity to ask some questions about ministry and life and hear from you. And hopefully we can just uh, glean some wisdom from you, your guys' experience and um, maybe laugh a little bit together this morning. So cool. that's our hope. So we have some questions here that we've come up with, and then we're going to text in some. You guys are welcome to do that. We'll be getting them up here. So uh, the first question that we wanted to ask you guys this morning is this. Think about this. What is your uh, biggest ministry failure or funny moment? Ministry fail or funny moment that you had? This should go together. You don't have to actually give us a depressing. Oh, I shared, I already... Is it on? <laughs> that right there was my biggest failure ever, not turning the <laughs> mic on. I shared both of mine already since I've been here. I think my biggest failure was wearing red underwear with white jeans with a hole in the crotch. That didn't go over well. Okay, I don't know if I can. And wow. then, um, yeah, sorry, you missed that, buddy. It was people ran to the altar after that. And then, um, <laughs> and then I think my, um, my failure was Kids 2000 and... Learn, losing thirty thousand dollars in the network crisis moment. And Can you share that with Don really I'd fast? I'd rather not. Because so I, as we move on, <laughs> <laughs> that would just make me feel better if you would tell him how much you <laughs> yeah, lost exactly. on one of it. <laughs> Maybe when we go to lunch and I'm just about to leave. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome, Don. How about you? Any funny moments ever? Well, ever? <laughs> yeah. It's embarrassing. So. I'm pastoring this church. It's just cooking. We're at multiple services, and it's Christmas Sunday morning. Yeah. And I'd done some research, and I found this fascinating quote by one of the early church fathers, Justin Martyr. Okay. And I'm quoting him Sunday morning. And I said, in fact, this point is supported by Justin Martyr. And I meant to say an early church father. But I said, it's supported by Justin Martyr, an early church farter. <laughs> and I'd have made it. I'd have made it. Because if, if you pull up, you know, full pot like that and you keep going, yeah. you're okay. Yeah, but you didn't. Usually you can. But I had a deacon <laughs> on the front row that looked at me and he went. Ah, 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 and just the whole place erupted. And at that point, you just have to own it. Yeah. You just got to yeah. own how, it. How do you move on from that? Well, you don't. You just enjoy the moment. Embarrassing, you know. <laughs> I wasn't wearing red, un red underwear, so I felt bad. So, yeah. <laughs> well, both of you guys have spent time um, not just as lead pastors, but also in different positions. Kevin, you were a children's pastor. Don, many different staff positions at churches. Um, so you have the perspective of not only a lead pastor, but also a staff pastor. Uh, and I think one of the things that as kids pastors we oftentimes ask is we can feel a little isolated sometimes. I don't know about any, any of you guys out there, but um, just even not in a victim way, um, but just by the nature of the beast, um, you're oftentimes, even if your church has invested in your own environment, it's separate. Um, the lead pastor needs to just trust you to kind of get the job done. Um, but yet your heart as a children's pastor is to come alongside the vision of your church. And so um, how, how can a children's leader best keep um, their children's ministry in front of their lead pastor and, and help to make that a win that their lead pastor um, can celebrate? Go ahead. Uh, I think a couple things um, that I've done and that you've done well, Josh. Um, I used to email um, my board with my pastor's permission right before the day before the board meeting. I would email them five, six wins, mm -hmm. or not probably three or four wins. Um, to give board members something to talk about when they go to a board meeting. Hmm. And if they're always talking about kids' ministry, because board members don't really think about stuff until it's the day of the meeting. Right. When, if I can give them something to talk about, when that projector's on the agenda about kids' ministries, all they've heard the last couple of months is positive, positive, positive. Yeah. 
ching, I'm not getting the youth departments, I'm getting a new one. So that's a pretty cool <laughs> thing right there. Um, and, I, and I think the other thing, well, then you did this very well, is um, I'm, in, I'm in writing mode all the time because I got, I got, the week comes quickly and I got to speak. Yeah. The more stories that you give me of what's happening in your kids' ministries without me having to go find them, allows me to talk about kids' ministries in a positive perspective that helps um, fulfill the, 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 the message of where I'm going. Yeah. But I want personal stories. I right. want stories that advance our mission. And, um, and so you just knock on my door, pop in, and say, hey, I want to tell you a great story, or you send me something. It, it just it keeps it on my radar, yeah. and it, keeps, it allows me to keep it in front of the people. Yeah. Um, and both of those are win-win-wins. Hmm. Um, I, I developed a kind of a mutual coaching with my most recent children's pastor and she just did an awesome job we were together for a number of years and, and we had this um the, this leadership play back and forth and part of that and you heard me talk about this the circle of concern and the circle of influence uh josh and i just got back from a two-week road trip where we did a bunch of sessions and maybe some of you were there but when i understood that she understood what was weighing heavy on me, yeah. then I was much more apt to listen to her because she'd already listened to me. And, and when she, I knew that she understood my agenda, then I reciprocally wanted to understand her agenda. Yeah. So she enlarged her circle of concern. It was beyond children's ministry. Uh, the uh, classic example of this, you know, if I would mention something like, man, I got a full slate today and I just got this call. If she responded by saying, yeah, I got a full day too, you know, and then that was just it. It's just mutual pressure. You go your way, you go mine. And all that does is fur further the silo. Yeah. But if she stopped and said, what do you got going? I said, man, I just got a hospital call and I got to prep for this meeting tonight. And if she said, hey, why don't you let me take the call? Yeah. I can go to the hospital. You know, I know those people or I can find out about them and I'll, I'll represent you in the church. I went, whoa. And, and that gave credibility. It put her chips yeah. in my pocket. So next time she wanted to talk about something, I realized it wasn't only kids. She's not siloed right. in that world that she cared about the mission of the whole church. Right. Oh, I think that's so good because oftentimes as kids leaders, isn't it true that, um, and again, we have to really make sure that we don't, we're not victims, but it's very easy to feel like we're just advocating for our ministry. Um, and we don't want only to do that, but we need to be intentional about, about doing both, enlarging our circle of concern to, to, to care about what's happening overall with our leaders, but then also put in front of them. Because, Kevin, I'm hearing you say, I know I feel sometimes I'm like, I don't want to bother. I don't want to be a bother to my lead pastor. They're really busy. But what you're saying is it's not a bother because when you say it, it comes out. The more you put in front of me, the more naturally it comes out as I'm having conversations oh, with people. Oh, by the way, I got a board meeting on Tuesday if you want to send me something. That's going to happen, yeah, definitely. Okay. <laughs> Absolutely, which kind of leads us into our next question. So, Bethy? How can... How, yeah. She's got a very quiet voice. I need <laughs> one right. of these all the time. How can a children's leader best come alongside, the, come alongside the lead pastor in the vision for the church? Yeah, I guess I kind of spoke to that already in, yeah. in terms of personally. Yeah. However, uh, I, let me talk about the vision of the church. Yeah. Because the vision of the church moves forward, and most lead pastors are going to be focused on adults. It's just true. They want to make sure that the students and the kids are cared well for yeah. and have good staff and covering on that. But for the most part, that's not... Now, I, I got invited. I would only speak six to eight Sundays in a row, and then I'd take two Sundays off. That became a rhythm. Mm -hmm. So on one of those two Sundays that I was off, I would go back and wander through the kids and hang around and meet people, and, and uh, that always felt cool, yeah. know, it, being involved in that. But when I understood that my children's pastor understood what we were focusing on for this year, like mm -hmm. strong families or uh, strong marriages. Right. You're not just a children's pastor. You're a people pastor. Yeah. You're pastoring parents. Yeah. You've got to have good tips on, on marriage, on date nights, on discipline issues, yeah. all of that. You're really an expert from their mind speaking in to every aspect that touches that child's life. Yeah, that's really good. Anyway. I think if I'm taking time to talk to our staff about something where the church is heading, I have an expectation that that's being communicated to the leaders mm. you lead all the way down. Yeah. Um, and so I can go up to a, 
uh, uh, someone that's working in the nursery and, and they go, hey, and they're using the same language that I'm using to coach the staff and our top tier teams. Yeah. I, I, I think that's what allows us all to speak the lame, same language, stay in the same lanes that we want to be going. Yeah. Um, and so that's, that's one of the way that uh, a children's pastor can really complement the vision of the church. Awesome. All right, this might have already been answered kind of in what you're saying in generalities, but can you think of a particular time where you'd say this is one of the best things that my kid's pastor ever did for me? Man, I haven't had a really great children's pastor. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, That's actually, a, uh, this is like a passive aggressive way for me yeah, to be complimented, exactly hopefully. Compliment there, if yeah. you pick someone else, I'm just going to be super disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I've, I've got one, okay. but it's not directly related to children's. That's fine. Is that okay? Absolutely. Okay. In our church, we developed this thing called a pre-preach, where I would do my sermon in advance, manuscripted, printed out, and give everybody copies of it, yeah. and then let them weigh in. And it, it was at first year, it was very painful for me personally. Yeah. But then after that, it allowed them to contribute. And we were talking about uh, going through, we went through books of the Bible, and, and I was teaching through uh, Romans 1, and it has this list of 26 sins, with the last one dealing with homosexuality. Hmm. Well, before she'd come to Christ, she was trained as the LGBTQ liaison hmm. in her high school. So she had all this language, and now she loves Jesus. Yeah. And, I mean, sin is sin, and we called it sin. But there's a way to say that something is sin compassionately, mm -hmm. or legalistic and judgmentally. And man, I, I got this, I, I'm sorry, I had a boomer brain and boomer ears and boomer eyes, and yeah. I just was so locked into this thing, and I, and I couldn't break out of it, and she saw me struggling with that, yeah. and she said, maybe I can help, and gave language, it was perfect language for that sermon, wow. and I remember preaching that day, where I, and, I, and I watched her as I used her words in my sermon, and she sat up and kind of looked around, and it just nailed it. Yeah. It, was, it was clear, it was biblical, it was focused, but it was compassionate, mm. and it was so helpful. And I realized I wasn't alone. And, and at that point, I mean, it was like locked in, full member of the team. <laughs> That's awesome. Josh, I would say the one thing, and you did this very well, the one thing I'd like my children's pastor um, to do and is... In, in our culture, I want them to create healthy tension for me. Mm. I want them to have such a vision that um, that's pushing me and pulling me. Yeah. Um, and I, I say this with any staff member. I, I want to lead um, horses that are pulling me, and I'm just keeping them on the same path. Yeah. But they're just pulling, and they can run as a team. Yeah. I don't need a wild stallion out that they're going to go. That <laughs> We can turn them into glue. Right. Um, I, I want... <laughs> but I want, I want thoroughbreds that can run as a team that are pulling, and I'm just keeping them yeah. together with the reins, and, and they, they're coming with a bigger vision. They're pushing me. In fact, here's what I tell our staff. If I'm not telling you no, you're not dreaming big enough. Yeah, you right. should create healthy tension in my life that I'm going, how do I fulfill all the things that they're dreaming about that align with overall yeah. where I'm saying we're going as a church? Yeah. That's really good. And that is so true. You said that time and time again. You can, you can have vision for your area. I would rather say no than say yes. I heard you say that several times. One of the things that both of you kind of are alluding to is the concept of leading up. You know, and I think that it's, there's a tension. I don't know if a lot of people know how to lead up. We know how to lead down. Um, we might know how to lead sideways to our peers, but even being given the open door, and that's something that both of you have done such a great job and been... Um, clear about the opportunity for the people who work with you, alongside of you, maybe under you would be the terminology, to be able to lead up for both of you. So I, I want to say thank you personally for, for that opportunity. To, to have influence as a staff pastor um, isn't always the case, but when it's given to you, um, knowing how to take advantage of that, um, it's important. It's, it's hey, one other thing I would add, and you yeah. alluded to this, and I think it's right. When you're the children's pastor or children's director or, or the lay leader, whatever title you have, have a vision for the church primary, yeah. then have a vision for children's ministry secondary. Wow. If you just have a vision for children's ministry alone, yeah. um, you're not going to complement the direction of the church. That's right. So see the big picture, yeah. and then have a vision for alignment, yeah. and um, you get a lot more yeses. Yeah, let, let me piggyback on, on your comment, too. Uh, regardless of whether you are full-time, part-time, or don't receive a stipend of any kind from the church, 
if we don't have an attitude of a servant, we're not going anywhere. I can trust those that I'm responsible to lead if I know their genuine heart is to serve. But if they're only looking out for their own interests, that, that's going to that's gonna bleed through. It just comes through in mannerisms and the word choices and, and all of that. So I think the most important... So you can actually gain the trust of your department leader, your lead pastor, whoever it is, by choosing to serve. If you are genuine, and that's really what we are before we're anything. Before you're a husband, wife, mother, father, uh, teacher, children's pastor, lay leader, whatever we are, the first thing we are is a servant. Right. We have to serve in those various capacities, but it's more attitude than action. Mm -hmm. We often hear the saying, God, then family, then church. But very often it can seem our leaders asking us to put the church before our family. How do we address this, and how do we have a conversation about it? I had her ask this. <laughs> no, I just think this is a tension that a lot of leaders feel, um, and the team brought it up. It came up in discussion is going, um, I think as we have strong leaders who um, we just see awesome things happen under their leadership, but the, they're going to be casting vision for where we're going as an organization, not always casting vision for where you're going personally as a family. So, you know, how do you guard that? How do you protect that? You know, how do you have a conversation about it? You want to go? Uh, sure. Go. I'll, I'll, I'll talk. Yeah. And then if it's right, I and won't you, talk. <laughs> well, okay. I'm in Montana. What are you going to do to me? No, I'm just joking. Keep going. Okay. So I'm a history buff. I just like it. Right. And yesterday was the anniversary of the university in India that William Carey founded. He died there. Mm -hmm. uh, missionaries throughout time have, have died. Uh, Jim Elliott and the Alka Indians. You know, if right. he would have had a conversation with his wife and son and said, listen, I know family's more important than, you know, ministry, but uh, I got to go, and if I don't come back, and, he, and, you know, the movie End of the Spirit shows that conversation with his son. Yeah. Right? So at some point... My life has to be expendable. No. But you can only do that once. The gift of martyrdom is like a single act. That's it, right? You can't, it, it's not like you develop it. Right. right? It just happens. Okay? So there it is. So oh, I like bracket, good. Bracket topics. Okay? So that, that, that's one end. The other end is if it becomes an excuse. Well, family first. Right. Family first. Okay. Family first. And you never sacrifice. Mm. That's ecclesiastical hypocrisy. Yeah. That's just, I, th my life is a life of sacrifice, ultimately illustrated by Jesus. <laughs> right. Okay? So there's this sliding scale back and forth. And we know in our hearts whether we're using family first as an excuse or a principle. Yeah. And that's where I have to be, I, I, I have to be intellectually honest and authentic in my own heart and mm -hmm. know that. And there were times when it was stinking hard on my family. Right. And you know what? It's good for them. It's good for them. I've yeah. had pastors say, I'm not going to move in the middle of the school year. Whoa, what about my kids? What about your kids? You're not putting them to death. You're hiring a moving van. Come on. <laughs> okay? I changed <laughs> schools and survived. Yeah. Your kids will change. Here's the deal. Sometimes parents make a big deal out of it, so it becomes a big deal to the kid. Yeah. But there are other times that it's a legitimate big deal. Mm. And that's where the wisdom of God comes in. Yeah. So I, I like to draw things on a, on a, a, like a spectrum. What's, what's the worst case scenario? Mm -hmm. What's the best case scenario? Mm -hmm. and, and let's genuinely be honest. So those are the, that's my response. That's a very good response. <laughs> that is an awesome response. Yeah. <laughs> like boom shakalaka. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Whoa, I got a boom from Kevin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. Hey, if you I, I answer another this. question, you're right, you'll get full body chills probably. He's going to throw I that I will out say here. this. Yeah, that's another <laughs> one. I, I will say this. Yeah. I have learned um, that not everybody runs at the same pace that I do. Yeah. And not everybody is married to a woman like I'm married to. Right. So that certain staff members have a different rhythm than my rhythm is. Um, and I have to be open to their rhythm. Yeah. At some point, if their rhythm is not quick enough to keep going with us, well, they'll mm -hmm. do better at a different church. That's good. Um, so because there is a rhythm that I set, and yeah. that we all have to do that. And sometimes there is that sacrifice. Right. But then I would go back to exactly what he says, mm -hmm. and 
and I, I, I don't like the order. I like that sometimes other ones pop above. Yeah. They, they do, you know, um, part, part of this is the relationship tension yeah. that goes, uh, all of us live in tension, and it's either healthy tension or destructive tension. And healthy tension's a good thing. You do. You know, each one of you have 14 pounds of atmospheric air per square inch weighing on your shoulders right now. It's good. Otherwise, you'd be floating around. But you've learned to manage under that tension. You don't even think about it, but it's all there. Yeah. It's all there, okay? So that pressure is, is, is survivable. But when it becomes destructive to the marriage, yeah. to the parenting, to your children, I, I think our family went through some very devastating times. All three of my kids love Jesus. They're serving in a local church. You know, you don't have to destroy the family by going through, you know, th yeah. those kind of hard times. So I think you monitor the tension level yeah. there. And if it becomes destructive, th then it's time to reevaluate. Here's the deal. There's always enough time to do God's will. Otherwise, he wouldn't ask you to do it, right? Mm -hmm. There's always enough money to do God's will, or he wouldn't ask you to do it. And there's always enough means to do God's will in terms of wisdom, timing, ability, knowledge, all that you have, both as a servant and as a parent. Mm. Okay. Just keep talking. I know, That's seriously. Good stuff. I don't have anything else to add to it. This is, this is awesome, right? <laughs> uh, I think to go along with that, we had this um, texted in just a minute ago. Um, it said, what's the hardest thing about being married and working in kids' ministry, or let's just say ministry in general, um, and what's the best thing about being married? Well, I won't say what's the best thing about being married. Um, <laughs> I do you have already five. have several times, I believe. <laughs> I, I, I do have five children, and I didn't get those by looking at her. Um, no, I, I, love, I love my wife. We just, I mean, it, being on the journey together and sharing the highs and the lows. The, I just, I like roller coasters. Yeah. I love to ride roller coasters, and I right. love when you go high, and I love when you fall fast. And yeah. So... To do that with somebody is always more fun than doing it alone. Yeah. Because the shared experience is great. So doing that with Tiffany yep. and keeping her in the journey. Yeah. Um, um, when I when I give our staff a book to read, um, I give her a book to read, the same book. Yeah. And um, because I want to use that same language, one of the things I've noticed is I'm always training our staff and pushing our staff to grow. If I don't take that same investment with my spouse, um, she won't grow where the church is growing, yeah. and she'll further, become further and further behind. And I never want that. We want to do this journey together. Right. My wife teaches full-time, so she's not at the church very often. Yeah. Um, so there's that different dynamic. I keep right. bringing, we have a system called Slack um, where we um, interact back and forth with all of our, it's like an instant messaging system for our staff. She's on Slack and can see the wins and the prayers that we put on there. And um, so I just keep her in the loop. And then um, if she has a dream or a vision that aligns with the church, I do my best to help her see that come to fruition. Yeah. Um, and I listen to her. And that's hard. Yeah. But I listen to her. She has great wisdom. Um, and I only say that because she's not here. No, I would, say that <laughs> if she, I would say that if she was. One time at kids camp, she told me not to put rubbing alcohol in a bowl and light it on fire for an Olympic torch. But I didn't listen. <laughs> And we almost burned down Cedar Springs yeah. camp. I spent a thousand dollars redoing the carpet because the glass shattered and shards of metal. Anybody there on that day? And the shards, of, yeah, you were there. The shards of glass came down in the middle of worship and burned <laughs> through microphone cords and into the carpet. And the kids began to chant at the next gathering, "Listen to your wife. Listen to your wife." <laughs> I've never forgotten that. <laughs> uh, that's awesome. That's, boy, that, that tops the red underwear, man. That's, that's, that's great. No, the red underwear, you had to be there. It so was... can you read the question again? Yeah. Um, what has been the most difficult thing about being married and working in ministry, and what has been the most rewarding? You know, um, Brenda, who's with me today down here on the front row, yeah. uh, we've been married 41 to somewhere around in there a lot of years. And she had her own career. She had uh, 15 years in public education and then another 15 years at Northwest mm -hmm. working in, in Christian education. Yeah. So she charted her own course. 
to some degree, are working together in ministry interfaces back and forth. So she'll work real well with me on, on projects. Mm -hmm. And she has this ability to carve out her own place. She doesn't do well when I give her ministry assignments long term. Honey, I'd like you to be this role. This, uh, now, if she chose mm. to be like in women's ministry or children's ministry yeah. or teaching or whatever, right. um, but I preach a lot of her insights. Yeah. I did, but she didn't necessarily like it in front of a crowd. Yeah. I think she does awesome, but her, her concept, where we talk about them privately. So, um, and now in this role, we have like mega travel schedule and she's with me all the time. And we're both looking at the GPS, trying to figure out how to get from A to B before the plane takes off. And so we're, we become partners in that. And that actually makes it pretty sustainable yeah. because she's becomes like the constant. Right. And her temperament is completely different than mine. I'm going to yeah. go to a, a room full of people and see how many I can talk to. And she'll choose one. And drill down, you know, go way deep and, and talk with them. And yeah. So we complement each other. And I will say, it was kind of funny, after being together for four decades, she's actually become more outgoing, and I've become more of an introvert <laughs> and seen the value of being alone and quiet. And so, so you know, funny. Jesus said, you become one. Yeah. You don't start one, you become one. Yeah. And that, I, I've just. I think we both noticed that in our marriage, yeah. that uh, we've complemented but strengthened one another. Right. Yeah, that's nothing like me and Bethy. I'm, I'm definitely a solid rock, pretty much stoic at all times, and she's super emotional, up and down. <laughs> we found that in our marriage, that I'm the one that goes here and here and here and here, and we'll visit a town. I'm like, we could live here one day, couldn't we? And she goes, Maybe. <laughs> and I, we moved. Another, we go to another town. We could live here one day, couldn't we? Maybe. She's just <laughs> and oh man, I need that so much. Thank God. Oh yeah. Oh Lord, <laughs> I would be dead. Seriously. Anything to add? <laughs> um, we don't have a ton of time, and so I kind of want to skip around just a little bit. Um, but I think this is an interesting question. It's a little going a different direction, but uh, I think a lot of people have faced this. Um, uh, it, well, I'll just ask the question. You guys can answer it however you kind of want to. But it says, how do you build and lead a children's ministry in a complacent church? That might take just half a second for you to readjust where we were going there. But I think that's, an, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, uh, I'll, I'll jump in. Yep. I think if it's okay, I won't zero in on children's ministry. Yep. Because I think that's a critical question on how do you build a ministry in a complacent church, period. Okay. Any kind of ministry. In, in, any kind at all. Uh, regardless of denomination in America today, 350,000 churches, almost 80% are plateaued or declining in every denomination. Every denomination. Chuck Lawless from Southeastern University said, there are only 6% of churches in America today that are growing by conversion growth. Wow. 6%. And those churches do these three things. Number one, they pray for lost people. Number two, they pray for lost people in their services. Mm. Every one of them. Number three, they pray for lost people in their services by name. That means everybody in that church knows somebody who if they died today would go to hell and not to heaven. Mm. So the mission of the gospel is in front of their face all the time. And I don't know how you can be complacent when you look at people like that. I'm getting my preach on here, sorry. But when you drive down the road, everybody in the car you pass is either saved or lost. They're either perishing or they're on their way to heaven, one of the two. And if I don't care about lost people, I don't care. It's just that clear. I don't care. So I just can't be complacent like that. I can't, and I have no tolerance for people that would hold on to tradition over the value of the gospel being exposed to that. There are excellent traditions that we have, and we should hold on to them because they propel the gospel forward. But Jesus had trouble ministering the mission because of some traditions in Mark 6. He tells us that. So I have... I, I have Here's the number one thing. You can't be complacent about complacency. You're a leader. Do something about it. Start talking to lost people yourself. 
If you don't have a handful of people that you see on a regular basis, I mean on a weekly basis, who are lost and far from God, your heart becomes complacent because it's incremental deterioration. It slowly takes over your heart and you slowly stop caring and you get more interested in the business of the church than the, mis- than the mission of the church. That's a challenge. It's a moment. I think I'll add on the kids part, just I'll take, because I agree with all of that, and I live that. Um, that's why I coach soccer, not football. Um, <laughs> I talked about that last night. But um, I think if you have a vision for your kids' ministry, and you feel like your church is plateaued and not going anywhere, and you're dying in it, um, your kids can invite friends. And if they're not inviting friends, you have to ask the question, why? You're the leader. Um, we, and and we, we saw that. Um, I, I led in a church that where, where our children's ministries grew, honestly, too big for the church. Did you know you could have a, a kid's ministry that's too big for the health of the church? And we decided we had to stop and we had to pull back because it was just draining the resources of our church. It became a problem for that. But I think um, if your kids are not inviting their friends... Um, they're not going to do it when they're youth and adults. We l- teach that as when, they're, when we have them right there. So communicate the gospel in such a compelling way that they want to tell their friends about it. And they want to have their friends there. And um, that's what will happen is it will lead up. Yeah. Because the stories that we're going to be coming out of your kids' ministries will impact every other area of your church. Because yeah. fire spreads. Good, really good. Um, what are a couple tools that you guys use on an ongoing basis? I think it's always cool to walk out of a conference like this with some resources, and you guys have seen kind of a litany of things. Kevin, I know you're looking every other week for some new app to download. <laughs> um, but what are some tools that you guys use um, to help you be organized? And we ask that because as, ch- as pastors, I think sometimes we get labeled in one of two boxes. Um, and I'm talking about like organize your week, kind of schedule your week a little bit. Um, we are either in the organized box and, uh, um, or we say, oh, we're just disorganized. Um, we're organized, but we're not relational. That's not acceptable. Um, or we're relational and we're not organized. That's not acceptable. What are a couple ways that you guys, tools that you use to manage your schedule to be organized and get tasks done, but also to be relational and lead your people? Well, I, um, I have, I use, just on my phone, I use reminders, and I, I love repeating reminders. Yeah. So I get repeating reminders all the time of the little tasks that I have to do. And no matter how much you delegate, delegate stuff away, you're always going to have, I have to send in my message, my message info every Monday by 2 o'clock. They need my questions and my key thoughts. No one else can do that for me. That burns in my heart. I have to share that. So I use reminders all the time. Okay. Um, I, I love Evernote. Um, the, the replacement to Evernote is just coming out. It's called Notion. Um, and mm. it has some cool little perks that Evernote does not have. We'll see if it carries all the way. And Evernote's um, board is a little crazy right now. And I'm going to so. give you a tip right now. Don't switch yet. W- give it a few weeks, and then we'll ask Kevin again if he's deleted <laughs> he's that app from his it. phone. R&D. <laughs> R&D. Yeah. But um, Evernote's great because it has a web clipper. So if I'm reading a... I'm reading a blog or something. I can click one button yeah. and it moves it into Evernote and sort yeah. it for me. I love that. I use that all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, so those, those are cool little um, tips that I use. But right. I, it's, it's the practical things is just I need to be reminded of things. And then, yeah. um, and then I, I like, I mean, I use Facebook as a way to connect with people. Yeah. The reason I, I'm, this sounds a little weird. I, I'm at 5,000 friends. Yeah. And um, I need to go to a page. Right. But that's stupid because I can't really comment on things as much uh, or post as, as yeah. the way I like that interacts. Right. So what I've been doing, I was telling a couple people about this, Shelly and Jan, is um, you can't go over 5,000 friends. So what I've determined is every time I get an email of the Facebook birthdays, I open every one of them up. And if they live outside of Montana and are a believer, I unfriend them. If they're an unbeliever, I'll stay their friend because I'm posting things that could influence their life. Wow. Um, so February 10th is coming up for me. <laughs> yeah. So, so. <laughs> but it, it, unless I have direct influence okay, okay. on you. Um, 
But then in the, if I'm keeping you as a friend, then yeah. I'll often send you a message. Or, yeah. And there's that personal touch. Wow, see, that's awesome. That's the kind of thing I, that, that's why I ask. Yeah. That, that's a there good tip go. right there. Don, how about you? I mean, these guys both live some of the busiest lives of people I personally interact with, if not the most busy. So this is, this is a good question. So the, the question is tools. What tools do yeah. you use? Yeah, what are tools? It could be yeah. uh, per personally that you developed over the years. Probably my, most, or, my most beneficial organizational tool is Tammy. Okay, your assistant. Yeah. Um, yeah. But then electronically, I'll, I'll use Evernote as, as well. Uh, and then I use, uh, I, I like leadership stuff. Mm -hmm. So I subscribe to a summaries yeah. uh, deal called leader, studyleadership.com. Okay. And you can read a 15-page summary instead of a 300-page book. And for 99 bucks a year, I'm just a little <laughs> quote here if you guys are interested. It's called studyleadership.com. Oh, yeah, this is great. Okay. And he will send you 30 summaries a year. Mm -hmm. And if you want a discount under promo code, just use the word turnaround. Okay. He's a personal friend. He's a church planter, and he's bivocational. This is how he makes his living. Yeah, can you say that one more time, how to get that discount sure. for people? Um, the website is studyleadership.com, yep. yep. and the promo code is turnaround. Turnaround. Turnaround, because... We're, we're buds, and so awesome. he lives in Carroll Stream, Indiana, and with Vineyard, and he's planted a church there. Yeah. This is how he sustains himself. Um, but there was a, a trick that I learned as a, as a staff person, youth pastor. I, I, was, uh, I, I would pray, and in those days, I felt like I had to be on my knees praying, you know, and I, I never pray on my knees now, ever. I, I pray while I'm walking or driving or, you know. So, and, and I couldn't concentrate. My mind would wander. And I talked to this older minister. I said, man, I'm having trouble staying focused. He said, well, what comes into your mind? I said, I am so focused on what I got to do today that all these ideas of what I have to do, I got to call this person, I got to write this, I got to right. study all that. And it just flares all over the place. And he said, Don, maybe that's not the enemy or you. Maybe that's the Holy Spirit helping you organize your day. Hmm. Why don't you take a pen and paper with you when you pray and stop and write it down, and then mm. pray some more, and write the next one down. Write the man that has saved my bacon over That's the awesome. last however many thirty years or so wow. of, of just being able to recognize that the Holy Spirit's trying to help me focus. <laughs> That's so good. One more. I love Audible, um, and yeah. I use Audible all the time, and I listen to books fast. Yeah. And um, I love it so much, and I was using it so much. I bought a subscription for every custodian on our staff, we yeah. have four. Oh, that's awesome. Because um, they're vacuuming, they're perfect. So um, we bought them all Audible yeah. um, subscriptions and books so that idea. they can, um, and they felt blessed beyond measure, and it was cool. Yeah, that's great. One of the, my favorite quotes so far, just thinking about pacing is, um, or Kevin, what you said about not everybody runs at the same pace. I just read in a book by uh, Edgar Schein. Um, it's Humble Inquiry. It's called Humble Inquiry, yeah. And at the end, towards the end of the book, he says, this is my way to tell Don I read a book that he uh, recommended to me last week. So uh, uh, it said at the end of it, um, he said, uh, you might have to adjust for people's pace, but it doesn't mean they're not getting as much done. I thought that was an interesting thing. There's kind of a little tidbit there is that you might run at a different pace just emotionally or maybe like you're – People say people who are task-driven get more done than people who are relational. That's not necessarily true. Um, it's just you have a different pace. That doesn't mean you're getting less done. That was kind of an encouragement to me, I thought. So um, that's cool. We got one more question Beth is going to ask, and then, uh, and then I'll ask the closing question, and then um, we'll take a little break here. Great. What are some tips and tools Josh, for children's pastors to continually develop in areas of self-leadership? Self-leadership, I think... Audible, and I read I read the same books, the the short summary books. I hardly ever read a full book, um, and right. um, unless I listen to it. Um, and then I think one of the things that's really helped me is I'm in a relationship with uh, three other guys that get together every year, um, get together every month through Zoom, um, and just challenge each other to grow, um, challenge each other. I mean, they have access to everything in my life. Right. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna finish this race. And there's two things that I've committed in my life. I'm not going to burn out. Yeah. And I'm not going to um, morally fail. Yeah. And um, so I have just parameters in my life to make sure that that's not going to happen. I, yeah. And I have people in my life that speak to that. I'm not going to burn out. I've talked to too many pastors that led growing churches that burn out. 
um, and I've investigated that, and I've talked with them about that, and I've asked them why, and I'm just not going to run at that rhythm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, but I'm going to run fast, um, and I'm going to finish the marathon ready to run another marathon, yeah. um, and then, um, and I know I don't have the body of a marathon, but maybe I have a brain of one. And then um, you have the body to burn some stuff off in several marathons. I just need to find the lady with. The f- <laughs> <laughs> I need to find the lady with the fanny pack and keep her close. <laughs> and I think the second thing, uh, yeah, and I think, and the other thing is, um, um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna win, I'm gonna finish this race with my wife by my side. Yeah. And I, I, she's gonna be my best friend. And I'm gonna be hers. Yeah. So anything I can do, anything I can do, to help make sure those two things are happening, that's what I'm doing. Yep. Read it again. And the question, what are, what are some um, tips and tools for, that's what you asked, right? <laughs> Just want to make sure. Uh, for children's ministries, children's pastors to continue to develop in self-leadership. Ah, self-leadership. Yeah, that's right. When I, uh, I took my first sabbatical, I've only t- taken two. Um, I read a book called Courageous Leadership by Bill Hybels. And I brought back four uh, suggestions that on his chapter on self-leadership there. Uh, he, he identifies that effective leaders spend 50% of their time leading themselves. And I thought, how do you do that? You know, lead yourself around by the nose? Or, I, how do you lead yourself? What was that? And so he talked about the input. And so the podcasts, the books you read, the people you hang around with, all of that were really helpful. And the four things that I chose to do were... Meaningful recreation. Um, I always had that down. Anybody that knows me knows I love to fish. And so you think about the word. Meaningful recreation. Rebuilding. Reigniting. I, that, that's what it does. And so for right. me, if I'm on my bike or boat, then I'm, shh, I'm there. The, the second thing was a teaching team. And I think anybody can develop a teaching team. We did not have any money to hire staff. So I booked missionaries. Yeah. I'd book them back to back and say, this is our series. Talk about your mission, weave it into yeah. it, but I need you to teach on this series. And, so, and that worked awesome. And I think you could do that too. There, missionaries would love to come. Mm-hmm. Be with, how do you think young people are called? I mean, that's, that's just an idea for you, okay? Yeah. So team teaching. The other thing was quarterly study breaks. Mm-hmm. I got away for three days a quarter and just got alone by myself. And I would spend the first half of the day, which for me would be about 5 a.m. till noon, studying, reading, writing, all of that. And then the rest of the afternoon, I would just I'd walk the beach or watch movies or do mm-hmm. whatever and just dial down, get away from people and pressure. And the fourth thing was um, get help with my inner world. Mm. Now, in my job, one of my jobs is to deal with ministers when they take a tumble morally yeah. and to see God restore them. And I have awesome stories about how God's grace has restored them after that tumble and a few stories that went sideways. But most of them, the restoration has been, been awesome. And I realized, just as Kevin said a minute ago, anybody can fall. Anybody can fall. Anybody can fall. And I don't want to see that happen to me. So when... I, I did hit the wall earlier in my ministry and sat out for a couple of years. And one of my counseling friends said, you're going to be able to recognize the signals earlier in your life now. So you don't ever have to hit the wall again. Yeah. And with God, great, God's grace, I haven't. But if you ignore the signals, and there are certain signals, a change in sleep, eating habits, depression, anger, flare-ups, all those kinds of things are signals that the leader is not responding well to the pressure that they're dealing with. And so I get help in my inner world. I see a counselor now every month, whether I need to or not, but I always do. I mean, it's just, for me, it's a safety valve. And it also takes pressure off of Brenda. She said, you know, I realize that you've got somebody to talk to that is absolutely sacred conversation in that, in that moment. And if you can't see a counselor, find somebody that you trust. In our network, we actually provide elders. We've got about 60 elders scattered all over the state of Washington, northern Idaho, that are available at a moment's notice. And they would develop a friendship and a relationship, and they're godly men and women that just serve in that capacity. Okay. 
All right, we got time for one more question, then we're going to take a break here. Um, we got to all of our questions that were texted in Good. From, from people, so thank you. But You didn't read the question I texted in. Uh, I, did you? Okay, I got all the ones that were sent up here because we can only take so, a few. Mine was, how do you get a job at Canvas? <laughs> okay, we'll skip that one. Kevin's been trying to actively recruit everyone away to Montana. Let me just tell you, Montana is a terrible place. You don't want to go there. You want to be here in my... You're happy to be out of no, it, right? That's exactly Absolutely. it. Thank God you that escaped. I'm back. Yeah, I think just... Um, uh, there's, I know there's always a line that an attention that leaders feel when it comes to the, even the word and the concept of creating an honor culture. Um, I think sometimes I've seen that go too far, almost to awkwardness. But for me, um, I do think it's important when I have both of my uh, two of the key influences and voices into my life up on the stage that I do just say a huge thank you for the vast influence that you guys, these are two obedient men who, because of their obedience and faithfulness to what God's called them to, this, um, uh, it's almost like we see leaders, like we see people's Facebook moments, the best of. We don't see the hard decisions that were made and the boardrooms and the one-on-ones and the family moments and all that stuff that's real to us that we go through. These guys have been obedient, and because of that, God has blessed their ministries. Um, but so many people have been touched by, by your guys' faithfulness. And so I want to say a huge thank you, really, to both of you. And thank you for being Honored here. Honored to be here. Yeah. Thank you. One more question, and then Kevin, um, this is our last time really having you up, up, on the, up on the stage here, but if you'd go ahead and pray for our, um, our children's uh, department, our area, Northwest Kids is what we're called, <laughs> but if you'd pray for us, because we're looking to develop a culture of connection, and what we have going on in this room and what we've seen happen at Fusion, we want more people to see that for kingdom gains. Not, not because we want to be buddy-buddy and have friends in here, although isn't it fun to have that, but because we want to see kids and families present with the hope of Jesus. And so if you'd pray, pray that for us, that'd be great. But um, I'll start with you, Don, then Kevin, you can answer them, pray. Um, if you could have a conversation with yourself in your earlier years in ministry, what, what's one of the things that pops in your mind that you would tell yourself? Yeah, it's easy. I would tell myself to talk less and listen more. I thought words were influential and I would skip over that scripture in James chapter 1 where it said let every man be quick to listen and slow to speak and slow to anger I had genuine anger issues that I had kept suppressed and buried and I thought I could mask it with many words but Listening is far more influential than talking. And questions are honoring. Jesus asked 265 questions in the Gospels. It is amazing how much you can learn when you ask questions. I I heard somebody say, if you're talking, you're not learning. You only learn when you're listening. Now, there's a time to talk, and I am a talker. I'm going to talk later on this morning, and I want God to talk through me to you, and I want you to listen to him beyond the words that I say. There's a time to talk. I get that. It's just not as often as we think. And I wish, and, and I, I went through a very painful season in my life, which pain opens the door to deep learning. And my pastor uh, said to me, he said, Don, you really need to be quick to listen and slow to speak. You're quick to speak and slow to listen, which means you're slow to understand. Mm. It's more important to people that you serve that you understand them than they understand you. But in your mind, it's more important that they understand you. Wow. And it it was this painful, painful learning moment where he coached me through and I was sure in this situation that I was absolutely right (laughs) and technically I was but my attitude was wrong and that's the relationship that we have to have with Jesus where he allows us or excuse me we allow him to call us out for the wrong reasons that we do the right things I think if I was to have a conversation with myself 20 years ago, um, two things I would have told myself. First thing is when I moved to Montana, not to get rid of my Seattle Seahawks season tickets. Um, I still regret, I mean, I I wear the socks, um, but I don't have the tickets. I would have kept them. So 
that was a bummer. Giving the socks away and keep the tickets. Um, <laughs> <laughs> these are my most comfortable socks. Sorry. <laughs> um, the no, second no. thing, um, I wish earlier in my life I would have seen the value of education. Mm-hmm. Where education was something I had to do to get a piece of paper. I, it's like when you learn the value of a dollar and you have to learn what one dollar and the potential of that one dollar could be. Um, it's not just a piece of paper. Um, that's why the rich people, um, it says that the, the, the richest people always stop and pick up a dime mm. because they see the value of it. Um, I wish I would have seen the value of education earlier in my life. Um, and so when I was getting my education and my master's, um, it, w- it was what I was earning and the depth that was there. I would have slowed down a little bit and minded even more than just rushing through it. Yeah. And um, now I have to play catch up a lot of times in my life. Yeah. And I look back and go, I had the opportunity to go deeper there. And I rushed over it just to get the assignment done. And the assignment was there for my value to grow deep in understanding and learning. And um, so I think that's what I tell myself, is see the value of education mm. and mine it for all it's worth. That's good. All right. Can we uh, express our appreciation for these guys taking the time today? Thank you.